So I, I'm calling it sabotaging uh, agile transformation. Actually, it's just sabotaging any transformation. I just tend to do agile transformations. So this is my sort of my personal experiences with doing transformations for various companies. Um, I am a sort of a disruptor. I am a guy who goes into a company to sort of break it in some level. Uh, that's why they bring me in. Um, and these are some of the techniques I, and, and problems I see when I'm trying to make these transformations. Um, Womack and Jones talks about the, the need to, for a transformation agent to come in and do these things. And to some degree, you need to be a tyrant in order to do these things. Um, and I am kind of that tyrant sometimes. Um, so I did my first XP project in 1998. And I was actually uh, did a conference presentation the next year about uh, using Agile in Java. Was, as far as I know, it's the first presentation on using Agile in Java that was ever made. Everything else before that was in Smalltalk. And I've done successful deliveries ever since then. Um, permanent transformations, though, have been less successful. So I've, I've gone in there, we've been successful doing a project, and then you come back a few years later, and everything you sort of taught them and how to do this is now gone. They're not doing that anymore. Um, and so I've used various mitigation strategies over the years to try to make these changes more sticky so that they actually stay. So why do I call it sabotage? Uh, basically, it's a couple of different things. I mean, they, literally, it's about you know, deliberately obstructing something, especially for political or military advantage, they say. Um, I think it actually is also accidental to sometimes. I think sometimes there's processes and things about the environment that will unintentionally sabotage it. And I will try to address some of those as well. And then you see numbers like this. And this comes from McKinsey. McKinsey basically said there's a, on average, the Agile project is 13% better at most, at most 13% better than just using waterfall, which says, well, why are you bothering with all this mess? And yet you hear presentations from guys like Jeff Sutherland who says, oh yeah, I, 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 every one of my projects at least four times more effective than a waterfall project. And in my environment, I tend to be the 4X, I tend to be sort of 4X or better sort of doing things and getting that production. So I don't know what these other guys are doing with their 13%. Um, but I can tell you what the stress of, of the system I bring to the table is. When I bring in stuff to the table to sort of do this transformation, the source of the stress is basically the speed at which we're beginning to work. Uh, we do continuous delivery, obviously, we do continuous integration, we do lots of things. And basically, the programmers are working in this sort of cycle. I call this the tasking cycle, where we take a pick up a task, we do some design about how to make the changes to the application to accommodate this. We do test-driven development, so we test it, we write the TDD stuff, write the code to make it work, we go round and round and round. And we finally integrate that with the system, and then we'll go back to another task. And it basically only takes us about 15 minutes to sort of two hours to go through the entire cycle. And this is a speed at which the organization doesn't typically work. And not only that, but since we're constantly integrating, everything is working, you can ship anytime you want to. And by the way, the business is not ready to handle that. They want, okay, well, in four months from now, you give it to me, right? Well, no, it's actually available all the time. You get to decide when you want to ship it. Well, how do I decide that? Dude, you're the business. This is your problem. So in a case study of, of sort of applying this, and applying this across, across sort of the pond here up in Nor Oslo, um, I worked for the Norwegian Welfare Association doing their deployments. And one of the guys has been reporting about how often they did deployments and what sort of changed in their environment. So we talked about basically he's got lots of graphs, but in, in 2018 they did about 135 deployments in the most popular product they were pushing. If you go back even two more years, it was like 12 across the entire enterprise, 12 deployments the entire enterprise. So the next year where, we, where I came in, in in late September, um, and this is how many deployments we had. And the three ones with the asterisk on, they're the projects I was working on. So this is the process I was bringing to the table. We were just pushing things all the time into the system. And this creates that stress in the organization, which is not used to seeing this sort of pace of delivery. So you're talking about who sort of gets in the way of this process. Who are the active saboteurs, the people that are trying to stop this sort of process? Well, the first one is basically the people who are losing power. Because power is the ability to control systems and, and sort of make yourself feel like you're important. And basically, these powerful individuals are losing it. 
because we're basically in, a, in an environment where knowledge sharing is the way we want to work. There's no such thing as I have unique knowledge, I'm not going to share it with anybody else. Yet some of these people are like, I am the expert in this. I don't want to share this knowledge. I want to be the expert. I want people to come to me and ask for my help. I feel good about that sort of stuff. You also have this appearance of, of sort of full stack developers. And all of a sudden, I'm not just a database guy. I need to worry about this other stuff. But I want to be the database wizard. I don't want to share my database knowledge or my deployment knowledge with somebody else. I want to be the guy that understands how to do, be, only do that. And then you got all the sign-offs. And sign-offs usually arise when something went wrong. So here's how we fix the process. We make it longer and put somebody else in place to sign it off. And you wind up with this whole chain of sign-off process. And these people think they're important because they're signing things off. They're not. But they have that control. And they're the ones that want to make sure you still go through them. I can't, ship to, I can't deploy something until I get this sign-off from these three or four guys. Well, of course, that kills my productivity. So you've got to get rid of those active saboteurs. So those are the guys who are sort of losing their job because of the way we're working. And that creates stress for them, if that's their role. Then you have people who are basically just don't match the process we're trying to do. You know, like our process requires you to do these following things. Well, I'm sorry, I don't need that anymore. I'm working so fast, I'm getting to a fast failure situation versus defect prevention. I mean, Agile is all about that trade-off. Do I, do I fail fast and figure out how to fix it really quickly, or do I make sure it never happens? The never happens stuff gets to be very, very expensive. You really want to look at that trade-off actively. And a lot of guys say, from a process perspective, it doesn't match. And that particularly happens to be around, often around the UX and UI. And our next speaker is going to talk about the UX stuff. But those guys have almost been trained and says, I need to go off in the corner, think about this problem for months, and draw your pixel-perfect stuff, and then you can implement it. Well, how about I want to try something different? Oh, no, I've got to go off and think about this. I can't talk to you until I get this right. You get a little bit of that also with databases and architecture boards. If your organization has these sorts of things, they will slow you down. They're process inhibitors. Oh, I want to change the message format. Okay, you got to go get an approval from that board. We got to make sure we got these universal, we got to get it signed off on it. But I just need this little change. It's not, not big. I'm sorry, you got to get the board approval. And then lots of other approval processes jump up. And that's where you see the process mismatches. And so one of the things you look for in an organization is where the, what sort of processes do they have in place that will slow us down? And how do we get around those sorts of processes? But those are also saboteurs. Then you have the guys that don't want you to succeed. Because if you succeed, that means something they've been doing all these years is wrong. And they tend to be passive aggressive. They tend to be sort of, you know, they want to minimize your accomplishment. Oh, that worked fine because it's just a web app. Well, real applications don't have this problem. Or I'm sorry, it's just the back end stuff. You couldn't do this with a front end application. They tend to minimi try to minimize your accomplishments with this stuff. It's almost like I call the reverse Hawthorne effect. Well, the Hawthorne effect is if you pay attention to a group, they'll just be better because you think they're special. These guys, are, we're not considering special. We can not consider them so special anymore. And of course, they, they want to be special. They've been they're used to being special. So how do you sort of handle these sorts of situations where you have these sort of people and processes that are standing in your way? So I talk about some of the mitigation strategies I like to use about this one. Um, and one is basically the Stalin strategy. Um, so this comes from Roy Singham, who's sort of the founder of ThoughtWorks. Um, strange to quote Stalin and think it's a good idea. Um, but one of the things Stalin had the philosophy was, was that if you and I disagree about something, uh, I'm not going to try to convince you otherwise. I can't. What I'll do is I'll talk to all you guys and tell you why he's an idiot. And you agree with me, and then we'll shoot him. So don't try to argue with this guy. Just don't talk to him. Go around him and talk to the other people. So avoid that active confrontation with the person that disagrees with you. It's not productive. You'll never convince him otherwise. You're just making a lot of noise, and people want to sort of escape that conflict you're seeing. And so I come up to this strategy that came from uh, Grunt, a character in, in uh, Mass Effect uh, lore, which basically says the greatest insult you can do to an enemy is ignore, ignore him. And so I do that with that guy who doesn't want to agree with me. I just don't talk to him. And he tries to engage me and say, well, it's an interesting opinion. And I go, well, walk away. And he gets more and more frustrated and more and more angry about that. That's good. I'm happy if he's angry. But he doesn't have the effect. He just looks like he's making noise. So don't confront that guy that don't, doesn't agree with you. It's not worth the time. 
you will not win that argument. Use the Stalin strategy. The other thing you use is use a sandwich strategy. Um, and this comes from the fact that I did some engagements early in my agile career with some companies, had massive success. Um, it was written up by consulting firms and stuff like that. And you go back a few years later, it's not, it's not, everything's gone. And you're sort of trying to figure out what went wrong here. And so the sandwich strategy says basically, look at it as, as sort of two tiers of people you're working with. There's first of all, there's the executive up there, the guy who is paying the bills, who wants this sort of the, this thing to be successful. And then there's the people on the ground who are trying to make it work. Now, the people on the ground, I can get them excited. You know, this process, this way of working is a lot of fun. You're doing something positive every day. You're doing continuous deployment. You're being successful in everything you work on every day. It's a happy place to be. But one of the things you want to do, first of all, is have a conversation with that C CEO. Make sure he understands what you're trying to accomplish. Make sure he understands how you're going to do this. You're going to be making a social change to his organization. It's not about writing code. It's about making a social change, having them think about their problem differently, having them own the problem. Now, there's a lot of guys in the middle, like this red guy, who says, I don't know what is going on here, but it sounds like dangerous. I'm one of these guys that's being impacted by this. My, my, my prestige in the organization is drifting. They're doing something really strange. I'm, it seems to be out of control. I've got to make sure it stops. So what does he do is he basically runs up to that CEO and says, do you know what these idiots are doing down here? And the CEO says, yeah, it's pretty cool, isn't it? And he says, oh, yeah, it is pretty cool. Because these guys in the middle tend to be risk averse. They tend to not have, want something threatening their job. And if the CEO likes this thing, they must like it too. And so they go back and they basically hide. So that's how you get them out of the way. They just kind of go back in their little clubs and stay out of the way. I know Kent Beck, over the years, has tried many, many times to have different ways of convincing middle managers this is a good idea. Games he plays and, and simulations and stuff like that. It's never been successful. It is successful to go to the top level because these are smart guys. They understand what you're trying to accomplish, and they will support you. By the way, if they don't support you, don't take the engagement. You will not be successful long term. But yeah, the sandwich strategy. Get the guy at the top happy, get the guy at the bottom happy, the guys in the middle you can squeeze. You don't care about them. So that's the sandwich strategy. The other thing you do is you basically inject competence if you need it. So I was working with a team in India, um, and they had hired a senior programmer, and he was sitting in the team, and he had a bunch of junior guys around him just fresh out of university. And I said, well, you know, you're responsible for these guys and helping them learn. He says, no, I'm not. I said, but this is your team. Well, yeah, but these guys need to learn the hard way, the same way I learned. And of course, they're not getting support. He doesn't believe in the process. He doesn't believe in any of these things. But he's a team lead. So how do you do that? Well, you know, the way I attacked that was I did drop somebody into the team who was competent. In fact, you know, one of the best programmers I'd ever worked with. I dropped him into the team. Didn't give him a title. Didn't need a title. And he worked with everybody else. And he'd help this guy do this. He'd help this guy do this. He'd pair with them. He taught him how to do these things. And pretty much after a while, the team begins to infuse him with power. Because power is something that people give you. You can't get it just because you have a title. It's something people give to you. And they were giving him that capability. Uh, sort of the, actually, at that point, the saboteur, the guy who's trying to make this stuff hard, he's ignored. Again, it's sort of a bit of a Stalin strategy. In the case in India, he finally quit. And we were like, good. Um, actually, our regret was we didn't fire him because uh, he was ineffective in terms of being a leader. So you can inject more competence in the team if you're not getting it from this guy. No, don't confront this guy. Don't try to convince him it's a good thing to do. He doesn't believe it. So again, don't confront him with that. Just work around him. And I dropped somebody competent to the team. And finally, actually, the change agent himself. If I'm in an organization making these sort of changes, you may want to remove me from the organization. And why do you want to do that? Well, it's, it comes from Womack and Jones again. It says, in order to be a successful in a change agent, you have to be a tyrant. But a footnote is, tyrants are always shot. So I'm used to having very short tenure, tenure engagements because that's the nature of the sort of work I do. And key is understanding when it's time to go. So again, I'm starting out here. I'm having this conversation with the executive. 
about what was going to happen, what it's going to do, and I will sit down and join development teams because I actually, you know, my, my fun is writing code. I like to write code, find new problems, solve new problems. This is kind of fun. So I join a team. So I come into the team and, and say, here's what we're gonna, how we're going to work and do some training and show, show them how it works and show them how I can go, how fast I can go. And some of the guys feel pretty good about that. And some are kind of on the fence and some are like, yeah, this is really suspicious. And the longer I stay there, the more it sort of gets more and more suspicious. The more they sort of feel like it's a really bad idea. And in, in fact, a counterculture starts to form. It's like, how do I kill Fred? How do I compromise his capabilities? And I, I become the rallying point for a sort of a, a small subculture that wants to make sure we don't be successful. They're going to try to sabotage it. But look what happens when I walk away. All of a sudden, this guy's like, well, who can I shoot? There's nobody to blame anymore. He's gone. So it turns out leaving the organization at the right time is actually part of the strategy to be successful as a change agent. It's get yourself out of there at the right time. Don't try to make this a five-year engagement. You're in there for a short time. So that guy will go away, and basically the, the team will reabsorb it and have the process. So that's the, that's the other strategy as a change agent. Get rid of your change agent if you're doing this. All right, that's sort of the personal sabotage towards. But how about the organization itself, the, the, the company you're working with, the teams you're working with? What about their culture and what's impacting you there? Well, first of all, you have this concept I call now success conservatism. So I go into our team and we start making these sort of changes and they're being more successful. And because they're more successful, the manager says, OK, stop. I don't want any more changes. We're, we're going to be successful here. But I can, I can prove some more. No, no, I don't want you to prove anymore. We're happy now. I don't want any more change. I'm risk averse. And so you have this, you know, build a high performance team, but then they lock him out. And one of the things is, it's good enough, let's don't do anything more. Making t and by the way, one of the things I like to do is I like to sort of seed people from other teams into the team, let them learn the process, send them back with their team. Or spin off a new team and sort of budding a team off our team and go do something else. We do that in Norway, by the way. We're working on, working on that very aggressive shipping things. We butted off a little team. And one of the things that happened was COVID. You know, we were all around for that sort of mess. Um, this is early 2020. I had already butted a little team off, and we came up to the unemployment benefit. says all of a sudden, instead of 100 applications a day, we're getting 10,000 unemployment applications. Our systems can't handle this because it's a manual system. So this little team we butted off just basically went in there and hacked a solution together in four or five days and, and had it out in the system. And they were using that sort of process. So they were very successful doing that. But I never got another chance to butt off another team. I said, look how successful this is. Let's butt off another team. Oh, no, no. Well, I got to keep this team together. They're working well. They already learned the domain. I can't touch them. You can touch them. But they decide not to. But again, success and conservatism sort of stops the innovation process. It stops that innovation from spreading. So you have to worry about that. Another inhibitor, titles and contracts. People, are, especially in Europe, tend to be under contracts. You have a contract with your employment. It has a title. It has responsibilities. This is what your job is. Well, that sort of locks you into waterfall thinking because that's basically what the titles usually say. I'm a front-end developer. I'm a back-end developer. I'm a database analyst. I am a user interface designer. But we'll be able to try to do three or four of those things because it's not in your contract. That obviously inhibits how fast I can work. If you have these specialists in place, and I've got to go from this guy to this guy, and then go to this guy and this guy, and I try to get this thing task done in 15 minutes, you can't get it done when there's all these handoffs. You need those full stack developers. And these titles inhibit an organization from doing that. I put a full stack development process in place when I was working at the Daily Mail in London. We had people that were leaving their jobs in other places because they were a full stack developer, but they could only do back end work. And they would say, I know how to do some front end stuff too. I can make this stuff work together. No, no, not your job. That's the other team's job. Stay on your lane. So they quit that job and joined us because they were allowed to do what they could do. They were allowed to be full stack developers. And that's actually the case of what we had in the Daily Mail. So in the Daily Mail in particular, um, we wound up had 50, we environment had 50 IT professionals. We had 25 different job titles. And there were actually literally zero people that knew what we were trying to build. Nobody understood the big picture. The poor, 
course, uh, iteration manager, the scrum master, so to speak, was sitting there trying to stand up every morning, trying to find out if they made progress today. And she was not technically understanding enough to be able to do that. But she'd ask this full stack developer this, or this question of this person, this person, this person, and try to put the story together. It failed miserably. So how do you attack that situation? Well, clearly we gotta have people who understand what's going on. So first of all, we decided we'd fix the titles. So we decided that the titles were inhibitors to us. What I really cared about though was your competence. Are you competent or all the way from you know, learning to be competent to be an expert in the things we care about? And we made a list of things we cared about from a technology perspective. And in this case, we're, we're moving into a new language, Ruby at the time. We had to worry about the front end platforms. We had um, obviously SQL and non-SQL solutions, et cetera. But those were the ones. And so we'd have our guys we considered to be experts rate our people on these, these various scales. What, are you a Ruby expert? Well, Ruby experts can tell you if you're a Ruby expert or not. Or are you kind of this journeyman, this sort of intermediate guy, or you just really need to learn it. So as the first step was identifying the technology we cared about and put this model together. Second step was to define new titles based upon competence, not based upon waterfall steps, where you're a senior, water, senior database guy. So we developed a new title called developer. That was for somebody who was competent in the technology, journeyman in my model. You can actually write Java code all day long and you're gonna do a good job writing Java code. You don't need a lot of supervision. Now if you need a supervision, we called you a graduate developer. You know, you're gonna be learning this stuff. So you, you're not, uh, you, you need to be pairing with somebody who does understand that. And if you actually became a wizard in something, we would call you a senior developer. So these are our masters or whatever. But then also what we did differently. We said, by the way, if you're competent in several different technologies, not expert, competent, we'll pay you the same we're gonna pay one of these experts. Because full stack developers can understand the problem they're trying to solve. And they know their limits. They know when to grab the expert. But now I'm beginning to have people who understand the problem they're trying to solve instead of just a scrum master. And just to make it life interesting, we created something called a master developer, which was a guy who basically was an expert in three or four things. You know, didn't have any of those people, but you know, aspirations there. We gave people training and sort of being full stack developers and letting them choose what they wanted to do. So we gave them some training and then let them decide, do they want to be an expert and stay on that path or do they want to become basically one of these you know, full stack developers? If you want to become a full stack developer, we will help you be that. If you, don't, if you don't have any background in mobile, then we maybe you want to be a, become a full stack developer, we'll drop you to an iOS team. And let the iOS guys train you how to be an iOS developer and then drop you somewhere else so you can become this full stack developer. We're willing to invest in your talents for doing that. So fixing the titles was key there. We did break down also, the, the, we took away the cubes and put tables in place, people were actually pairing, uh, doing TDD, all these other things. We actually actually changed languages. We went from a Java shop to a Ruby shop and actually a closure shop as well, again, to sort of disrupt their thinking and think, thinking differently. But the key was breaking the titles. It turns out the third thing is to fix sabotage is where people sit. So it turns out where people sit turns out to be really important in terms of communication. That you want to, right now we typically sit departments together because that's the manager, here's the people of departments and stuff like that. We typically do that. And we have to have so, criteria like, we have to have this much space per employer. We have these rules, especially in Europe, about how much space each per employer has to have. You can't put too many people in a little space. All right, so that actually turns out to be a problem. So how do you mitigate that with the seating? Well, first of all, you really don't want to sit the department people together. You want to sort of split them up across the projects they tend to be working on. So this comes from basically uh, a guy named Tom Allen. Um, MIT professor, um, former aerospace engineer. He said basically the chance of you and I communicating varies inversely with the square of distances between our chairs. It's that easily as simple. So if you and I are communicating at a certain level here and I double the distance, there's only one chance in four of us talking. I double it again, it's one chance in 16. He actually measured the intellectual distance of a staircase, it's 100 meters. If I go to go downstairs and talk to these guys, I might as well have them in Bangalore because the square of the distance is going to be the same as having them in Bangalore. You're not going to talk to them. 
And what do you see in terms of buildings? Well, of course, you know, here's the building in multiple stories, and we've got this department over here, and this department over here, and this department over here, and you wonder why they're pointing fingers at each other. It's because you've, you have created an environment where the communication is not flowing naturally. So what do you want to do instead? You basically want to co-locate the people that are working in the same thing across their disciplines. I want the scrum master, I want the tester, I want the, I want the uh, user interface guy, I want the front end and the back end programmers, I want them all sitting in the closest possible to each other. So in Norway, where we had constraints about how much space we had to have for each individual, we would have, quote, meetings a lot in our area. And we would have a couple people coming in our meetings, and we would put two or three times as many people in the same space as sort of officially allowed. But we were just having meetings, that's okay. Um, and basically, we were highly productive. That's how we got the productivity. Literally, our beta users were sitting outside our area, literally uh, 10 meters away. I could always talk to them that easily. But my, my UX designer was in that room. My lawyer, who was the expert in the law we were implementing, was in that room. The, uh, the iteration manager was in that room. Our front-end back-end developers were in that room. We had lots of whiteboards. We were drawing pictures all the time. You could overhear our conversations. That's what generated our productivity. By the way, Zoom, not bad for this, because in Zoom, basically, everybody's equidistant. The only thing I sort of lose when I'm doing Zoom and Zoom rooms is I can't overhear a conversation. People have to sort of ask for help. So I'm a little less efficient, but it's not bad. Uh, I've obviously with the, with the pandemic, we've had a lot of remote work. We haven't been that, we haven't slowed down much because of that. All right, so that's, you know, how we mitigate, this, mitigate that. All right, other sort of sabotage. Uh, Oversights, permissions that are required, review boards, architects, standards, always doing it this way. These are sort of things that an organization will have in place that you need to break through. Again, having that conversation with the top level executive, telling what's going on and getting his support for these activities is key. Because otherwise, these guys will kill you and kill your productivity. The other thing is, is pro uh, from a process perspective, a lot of organizations, unfortunately, I've seen, that say, well, instead of sort of empowering our programmers and investing in them, all they need to do is hire an agile coach or a scrum master and drop them into the team. And he's going to push a process, he's going to push some tools, and that will cause everything else to ripple through and will be really successful. Uh, it tends to not to be that way because their job basically is to begin to enforce processes. Um, and enforcing processes is not sort of the way to get the buy-in by the programmers. The systems I try to teach and the way I try to work is empowered teams, people that understand how to do their work, turning them loose and making them uh, feel responsible for it, not putting somebody in place to sort of be the schoolmaster. So I've seen that have a problem. And the other thing I see sometimes is a lot of times we'll have complementary workforce. We're, we're hiring contractors to fill our slots because we don't have it otherwise. But I don't want to invest any time in training these guys in these new ways of working because they're contractors supposed to already know this stuff. Well, they, they don't know it any more than your guys know it. They need to be trained as well. I've had companies that feel comfortable doing that, working with General Motors. They felt completely comfortable training their contractors in the process they thought were important. I've had other organizations that refuse to train their pro pro contractors. If you can't do it, I'm not going to train you. I have some sort of compromise to say, we'll let you come to our, we'll, we'll, let you, we'll let, uh, pay for the class for you to attend, but we're not going to call it billable hours. You can't bill us for the time you're learning. Not a bad compromise. There are some other types of sabotage that I can get into. We don't have a lot of time for that, so I'm going to sort of skip through that, that quickly. But basically, you have sort of social sabotage where the culture itself is kind of um, sort of anti of some of the things we're trying to do. And then you have sort of the accidental sabotage, things that are happening that not deliberately by any, any means, but just things that sort of go wrong that sort of will sabotage your efforts. Um, for example, the customer decides he doesn't want the application after all, after all the time we've invested in it. So more recently, I've been using this concept. I mean, I've been thinking about this concept for, for many years, actually, when I was working in ThoughtWorks, I tried to think about, I was talking about this. And that is sort of bringing in what I call a pod. So if you're going to make a, tra a transformation, bring in a pod, which is more of a comprehensive engagement model that says, I need to worry about all of these breadth of problems that I've talked about here. And so about a pod, what I mean is basically um, to support the strategy of what we're trying to do. Now, the company I'm working for in Norway, Cynthia, 
Centev basically has as their core strategy our, uh, our desire to enhance the software delivery capabilities of our customers. In other words, we're there to get, make them better, not to be there permanently, not to write all their code, but to make them better software delivery. And we're very picky about the people we bring into our company for that purpose. So when you're talking about a pod, we're talking about a whole wrath of, of capabilities we want this pod to have. We want them to be able to understand the problems that they're working with, to be able to look at a problem and do something like, like the Ken Nevin model to figure out is it a complex problem, is it a complicated problem, and use the right technology associated with that. We're also looking at them to worry about um, how you coach that. We've got to coach the transformation. We've got to be able to provide that coaching associated with the, with the process. Training is required, leadership, agile process, and actually getting actually some metrics as well. So we want to bring all those capabilities to that organization, as well as sit down and do them. But we want the client also to bring something to the table as well. They're the domain experts. They got to bring the domain knowledge with us so we can work with them and understand what they're trying to solve. They understand how to deploy software in their environment, all the process we have to do that. They understand that. If there are certain compliance rules that their industry requires, for example, in pharmaceuticals, we need to make sure they understand that and they're bringing that to the table. And of course, we want developers who are willing to learn and change their processes as well. So it's kind of, a, again, a cooperative model where we're going to bring in some of the skills. We'll do a very focused initial engagement, a very short initial engagement, uh, almost a, as you might call a kickstart in some environments, where we sort of get that training done, do some initial development, get them used to the process. Because when we train them, train them in a process and we're trying to use, it looks very strange to them. And at the end of the class, they say, yeah, this is really a nice process, but you're using it only for these certain examples. Our example is, is going to be different than that. I'm very skeptical of this. You have to drop down and actually begin to write code with them in their problem. And they say, oh, wow, it actually does work. It doesn't take very long to make this work. So again, we're working with a client uh, last, was it last year or this year? Actually, it was this year. Uh, this year, we're working with a client, uh, or Earn Software. Um, and we proposed basically an eight-week engagement with them, uh, five weeks, which, uh, which was basically pure pod stuff. And, and it turned out that three more weeks before the summer holiday, so they wanted to do an eight-week engagement. Uh, I had extensive discussions with the executives ahead of time. So that discussion with the, with the C-level executives, I had extensive that for almost six months before we had the engagement. So I had their buy-in to what we're trying to accomplish. Again, they were a little skeptical it could happen. Uh, but they were willing to, willing to do that and supporting us. And that was the enabler for the sandwich strategy. So the sandwich strategy was going to be very successful there. Uh, so lots of pre some presentations to the group overall about what was going to happen, so they're not surprised with some of this stuff. Again, they probably didn't believe it could happen. But at least I had a chance to stand in front of them and, and tell them what's going to be happening. And then I helped sort of pick the initial participants in the project. In this case, we picked a lot of tech, tech leads because we wanted to take some of this knowledge and spread it through the organization, which actually spans three different countries. Uh, actually, make it four. They're in Iceland, Sweden, Norway, and Finland. Um, and so we wanted to spread that out. So we had some that. And we picked some projects as well. We were looking for two different projects, trying to be two different type of projects, that we could try this on initially in that eight-week period. So we did both of those. And of course, we had to go up to the board of the company to get approval for this sort of stuff because it's a fixed price project. We were giving them a fixed price for that five weeks and with the things we we're going to get. So here's what it looked like from a timeline perspective. There's our eight weeks. So in the first five weeks was a pod. It was a fixed price. We had the training associated with that was built into that. The application architecture was decided. We did some readiness assessments and some metrics. We're going to bring all that stuff to the table as well. And then we had three weeks more, which was basically continuing some of the projects we're starting, including starting another domain to see if it works in two different domains as well. So the training took the first six days we did training. Um, we trained them in both object, some object oriented programming techniques as well as some basically fuzzy problem techniques, some microservices techniques, because one of the problems was very much related to that. Um, we did have some, you had 10 people participating in that, uh, plus our consultants ourselves. And again, the tech leads. Um, we taught them things like pair programming, TDD, the tasking cycle, working in fast cycles, uh, the agile process refinements, et cetera. Uh, we did talk about what the problem we're trying to solve. So we met with the business experts in that first day to sort of see what type of problem we're trying to solve. 
And this is where we basically began to pick the application architecture. It turned out it was actually an ideal fit for a microservices architecture because it was a fuzzy problem. They wanted to look at energy meters and decide if that meter is broken or not, based upon the readings they're getting or not getting. And that was a problem. And of course, they're just guessing whether it's broken or not. We're not sure why it's not working. And that makes it a fuzzy problem and appropriate for microservice architectures. Uh, we start writing stories around that domain after, at that point in time, so within two weeks we were writing stories. That first sort of five or six days between the end of the training was we were building some frameworks associated with the microservices so that they could have some, uh, an easy time of developing these services as we developed them. So we got the stories in place, put the metrics in place, and then basically started developing. Uh, so within that time frame, we actually you know, built the framework in that first five days. Um, we used a lot of mob programming, which I'm, I'm in love with for starting out things so that everybody understands why we did things. Where does this architecture come from? What were we trying to accomplish? Everybody's curious about that. Uh, make sure they all know that. So we had stand-ups. We started rolling to all the process, so say, all the stuff you expect to do, trailer walls and the like. And we had an implementation that we could demonstrate to the customer after five weeks. It was actually working, which was, you know, they were very happy with that. Um, I've, I've gone back, I went back a few weeks ago and talked to these guys to see how well they're working and they're, they're fine. And so I, I spent basically three days with them. I probably built about eight hours of stuff, but their process is continuing. They're working fine. They're very productive. They're bringing new people on board and teaching them the process. It's running fine. This is a, a transformation after only this eight week engagement. Well, we also started the second project about this point in time, about halfway through, we started the second project, got a briefing on what the domain was. Um, did the initial mob programming with another team, so we broke the team into two groups and they kept working on this one. And again, we created an, another framework because it's a different set of problem. It took it a little, about four days to get that running. Uh, again, everything else was, is in pretty good shape. Again, repeated this process for those guys. And again, we were able to demonstrate something very quickly. We also had some more experiments. We wanted to we see what happens when I just add more programmers into this process that don't go through the training with everybody else. Can they pick it up from their colleagues? Another experiment we were trying to run. So we had two guys at that point, um, added two more at this, plus the UX guys, and we absorbed them very readily. They understood, yes, it's kind of weird, but I understand how it's working, and oh my goodness, I'm writing code every day and get deployed. This is kind of cool. So again, this was a very successful engagement. When we talk about a transformation and you're able to do it in five or six or eight weeks, this is a speed that you don't typically see. But again, the background was get the, get the sandwich strategy working, get that executive happy with you, get the people happy with what they're working in, and the rest of the organization, um, based frankly, can go to hell because we'll ignore them. All right, other mitigation techniques I use. Um, I'll sort of close this out. Labeling things as experiments. This is a very powerful thing. So if you have an idea or something you want to try, try it, call it an experiment. Don't commit to say, we have to do this for the rest of our life and it's going to, every team has to do the same thing. Make an experiment. When people argue against experiments, they look really unreasonable. What do you mean? You don't even want to try it? It might work. Oh yeah, you can't try it. I'm sure it's going to fail. Those people look really unreasonable. So just label something an experiment, you can get these ideas into the process. And if they're successful, they'll take off on their own. You got to keep the executives always involved. You can't keep them in the dark. You can't go dark on them. You got to keep them and bring them into the thing. Keep them updated all the time what's going on, about the social change going on. Take the programmers with them to the executive. Have them talk about what's happening and have that experience. Keep the executive continually involved because he's always going to be getting pressure from those little red guys coming up saying, oh my goodness, they're breaking this, they're breaking this. He's got to understand it's continually working all the time. You want to keep that working. Find and kill the fear. Um, one of the agile processes is basically called courage. One of the principles behind it is called courage. I usually read that as killing the fear in the organization. Fear is kind of the mind killer sort of thing, as they say. Um, so you find things that inhibit, that create fear, and you try to kill them off. Estimates. Oh my goodness, here, I need an estimate from you. How long is it going to take? Of course, if I give them that number, it's, it's going to be another question. Why did it take longer? Why did it take shorter? It doesn't matter what you can do. You can't win this game. And of course, now I don't want to say that. Maybe I'm going to stand up and I have to sort of say, how long is it going to take me to do this? Well, I know if I pair with this guy over here, it's going to be finished in two days. If I pair with this idiot, it's going to take five days. Do I say five days? They'll think I'm an idiot. 
But say two days to get stuck with eating, I will fail. Fear. And so you find these questions that create the fear, and you kill them off. And estimates are certainly one of those. You've got to shield the business from the normal business chaos. You've got to shield the team from the chaos. There's chaos all the time on the business side. Oh, what about this feature? What about this feature? What about this feature? You can't let that filter through the team because they'll just see, oh, my goodness, the business keeps changing their mind. There is the plan we're working on. We, and IBM, we just call this a plan of record. This is the plan we're working on. And until the plan of record officially changes, we don't worry about anything else that's going on. So you've got to shield them from some of the chaos that's happening out in the outside world because uh, there is chaos out there. You want to practice what I call Agile Schizophrenia. I have a presentation on YouTube that talks about this as well. If you're doing Agile the same way on all your teams, you're not Agile. Every team, every problem is different. And they will morph as they, as they develop and become more and more effective in their processes. If you're doing Agile the same way in all your teams, if you have a book about how you do Agile and everybody's doing it the same way, you are definitely not Agile anymore. So make sure you're not trying to hold that back. Ask other executives how it went. Frankly, nobody believes salespeople to come in or white papers that say, here's, here's an amazing thing that worked. Look how well it worked. Why would you believe me it says Earn Software Works? But how about talking to the Earn CTO and see how he thinks it worked? Those guys are very powerful advocates for what you're trying to accomplish. So find those guys and find those developers. So that's sort of my story about sabotaging transformations and the sort of things I've run across and some of the mitigation strategies I have. You can never mitigate all the, all the sabotage that's happening, but you can sort of have enough to make sure progress is continuous and you're still doing that. <laughs> <laughs>